quite well, you meet well, you're sociable, you're friendly. Any, some of you people out here, any one of you could lead more, lead more people to Christ in a week than I could in a year. But you don't do it. Get mighty quiet in here, preacher. <laughs> you know why you don't? Because you're sorry. You're just sorry. <laughs> you just keep your personality for yourself. You won't give it to God. It's always been hard for me to do personal work. I do it. And I've led people to Christ. I've been saved now about 38 years. I've probably led about 3,000 people to Christ. But that isn't much for 38 years. I mean, what's that, uh, something like 100 a year? That ain't much. I know some people lead 100 to Christ in a month. And uh, you got to win people to Christ, you have to be soul conscious. You have to see people as souls. I don't think you realize how hard it is for an artist to see people as souls. When I see people, I see the line, the figure, the contour, the shadow, the perspective, and begin to size them up right away as a person. You can't do that and be a soul winner. You have to look at unsaved people as souls. They're going to heaven, they're going to hell. When I get in a, in a strange city like this city, any other city, and a fellow gets in the elevator with me, you know, about 10, 11 o'clock at night, I'm over in the corner, and instead of getting ready to witness to him, I usually back up in the corner and kind of relax my knees and get my hands up in here, and if he makes a move, it'll be all over the wall. <laughs> you say, what makes you like that? Takes all kind to make a world. <laughs> I've never been jumped in an elevator. I've never been jumped in an airport. But if I do, the guy get a bag in his face and then something blow the bell before he knows what he's doing. <laughs> the reflexes are like that, you see. Now, those aren't good reflexes for a soul winner. <laughs> Jack Hiles gets in the elevator and he says, you ready for the big lift? <laughs> That's the way to do it. The guy says, the big lift? Yeah, the big lift. When the Lord comes and calls you up, you ready? See? Now, the ways to do that thing, you know why Brother Hiles has such good success in soul winning? Because he sees people as souls and he, he looks for an opportunity and opens an opportunity. He'll go into a flower shop, get some flowers for his wife for an anniversary. You understand, any of you could do this, what I'm talking about. Any of you could do what he does. He goes in there and says, well, have you got this? No, have you got that? Well, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see that. Beats around the bush a while. And then he says, uh, have you got the Rose of Sharon? And they say, the what? The Rose of Sharon. I never heard of that before. <laughs> well, let me tell you about it. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. See, that's the way to do that thing. Now, there are two kind of approaches. One of them is a direct approach. One's an indirect approach or a natural approach. And of these, the natural approach is the best approach if you can do it. Now, the direct approach is simply, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Are you going to heaven when you die? See, that's direct approach. And that's all right, but a better approach is indirect approach. A better approach is where God opens the door to the conversation and the ways to do it. All kinds of ways to do it. The man that led me to Christ, Brother Hugh Pyle, you know, in Pensacola, Florida, and he walked in the door, and I said, Hi, preacher, what do you know? And he said, I know the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you know? That's a good opening. <laughs> and I said, I don't know him. And he said, Would you like to know him? And I said, Sure. And he said, What you waiting for? Which well, seemed to me kind of stupid. I've been trying to get saved for months. And he said, what you waiting for? I said, I don't want beats the fire out of me. And he said, well, come in here. And took me back in the record room and led me to Christ. And that's an opening. How are you? I'm saved. How are you? <laughs> See, stab him. <laughs> old uh, Ehud, he back in the Old Testament, Eglin's a fat man. He had goes to witness to him, and he had as a sharp two-edged dagger. And he walks up that fat man and says, I have a secret message from God for the old king. And he says, what is it? And he said, it's this. <laughs> and sticks it in, you see. Now, the Bible said, let the saints of God have a two-edged sword in their hand. Jeremiah says, cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from drawing blood. If you can't win them to Christ, at least wound them. <laughs> We're getting off the track already. <laughs> but that's the idea. I mean, they're, they're openings, you see. I mean, when you get witness down the plant where you work, they're going to call you preacher. They always do that. How you doing, preacher? How you doing, preacher? You say, how you doing, sinner? <laughs> oh, yeah, man, that's ways to do it. Where are you going? I'm going to heaven. Where are you going? See, so land on them. I remember one time a guy stopped by my house, and his wife's in the car, and he came up the door in the middle of the night and said, uh, could you tell me how to get to Highway 29? And I said, uh, yeah, what's the matter? Are you lost? And he turned around to his wife and said, yeah, I guess we're lost, aren't we, honey? <laughs> now, if you couldn't take it up from there, you better quit. You see, what you want to do is be filled with that word so you know opening when it comes. And pray for an opening. 
If you sit next to somebody on a bus or a train or a plane, pray and say, God, give me an opening, give me an opening, give me an opening, give me an opening. He'll open it. He'll open it. Now, Walter Wilson was a great one for that. Uh, one, he's on a ride in the plane, you know, and the stewardess come by and said, what are you reading? He says, a Bible. And she said, what's that? He just happened to get a sure enough pagan, you know. What's that? And he said, it's a book. And she said, oh, what's it about? <laughs> now, can't you carry it from there? <laughs> what's it about? And he said, it's about you. See, that's, that's wisdom, you see. And she said, oh, what does it say about me? I'll show you. <laughs> All of sin and come short of the glory of God, there's nothing. Away you go. See? Now you can pray and say, God, give me an opening and show me how to do it. And they're direct and indirect openings. Uh, the thing that's wrong with the service is real simple. The service, the Marine, the Army, and the Navy have all kind of Christians in them. They're all throughout there. But they're all intimidated. And they're all keeping their mouth shut. They're all playing it safe. And the thing is, one of them needs to speak up. You know, the guy that, that when, I, when I was on the Philippine Islands, only one time the service did anybody ever witness to him, witness to me, my company commander, took out a Bible one time, and he said, Ruckman, he said, you're always reading the stuff. He said, let me read you something out of this, and took out a Bible. And I said, I'll put that away, it's a lot of baloney. And he took it and put it away. Now, if he'd had any training, he hadn't had any training, he would have said, well, that may be one way to look at it, but did you ever see this? <laughs> and goes the sword. You see, what the devil wants you to do is put the blade away because it'll cut and divide between the soul and spirit. If I thought he had training, he'd have picked that thing if he didn't have any, so he put it away, and I never got witness to. Now, there's a way to do it. You can do it directly, you can do it indirectly. But start sometime. Find out where the Christians are. You never know where they are. I was preaching out in the street in Spartanburg, South Carolina one time, and in Spartanburg, South Carolina, we had one of the greatest preaching places in the country. It was between two buildings on Highway 29, downtown. And boy, when you get between those two buildings, back into the sounding board, and your voice would go out there, and you hear that thing for a city block, both sides. It was a wonderful place to preach. We'd go up there Saturday and preach for three hours out there. I'd come home just croaking. And I remember I went up there one Saturday and got to preach, and the rain began to come down. And when the rain comes down, you can't set this thing up. The paper gets wet and it all goes to pieces. So I was praying, God, please stop the rain. Please stop the rain. And I've seen God stop the rain. I've seen God stop the rain many a time. I've been preaching youth camps in a tin building where that thing was drumming that tin roof so hard you couldn't hear nothing and knelt on the platform in front of 400 kids and asked God to stop it. Had him stop in 20 seconds. I've seen that kind of thing. So I began to pray and say, Lord, please stop the rain. Going to get the border wet. It just rained harder. <laughs> I said, well, God, it's your corner, it's your gospel. Okay, if you don't want them to hear, you know, you get with the Lord sometimes. Okay, if you want them to go to hell, you don't start watching. Oh, maybe you don't talk to the Lord like that, but I get going that way once in a while. I took that thing and threw it back in the back trunk, slammed the door, you know, went over there, you know, all miffed and sullen, you know. Went across the street to the dime store, got me a cup of coffee there at the counter, you know, mumbling and grumbling. Well, you know, it's your gospel. Okay, if you've got the place, if you don't want to hear them, okay, okay, you know. And I'm getting a cup of coffee, and the guy comes and sits down next to me and gets a cup of coffee. He's a shoe salesman right next door. He evidently had a good day of selling shoes. And he sits down right next to me, and he says, uh, sure been a good day today. And I said, yeah, there's a greater one coming. And he just got a newspaper open, got the coffee about here, and he said, oh, what's that? I said, the day of judgment. And he went, oh, <laughs> Shot that coffee all over the table. And he said, oh, yeah, 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 day of judgment. <laughs> You know, I got dealing with that guy. He was a saved Methodist steward, and he got me into a Methodist church there, and I saw 22 teenagers saved as a result of that contact. Now, I think you just open your mouth and find out where they are. If you're in a barracks with a bunch of guys, pick them off one at a time. Get back in the little train. Get them out in a 10-minute break. Pull alongside them, you know. Say, boy, this thing's a mess. And it was like it's going to the spa. The fellow said, it's hot in hell. You know what he said in that spa? It's hot in hell, you know. And say, uh, say, do you reckon? <laughs> I said, reckon what? You reckon this hotter than hell? Oh, well, yeah, 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 you know, you're going mess him up, man. Oh, uh, Mc, Jane McGinney, the little old short Scott preacher, one time he got out and got out of the gas station, a big old six foot attendant came up there pumping gas for him, mopping his brow, a hot summer day. That big old gas station attendant said, uh, you know, it's hotter than hell, you know that today? And McGinney went right up to him and said, Sir, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to meet a man that believes in hell. 
and got him by the hand. And that guy tried to pull back and McGlynn grabbed him with both hands and said, Sir, it's not every day you meet a man that bleed this hot. My old boy was standing there. He was sweating more from the sunlight then. And McGinley got right up next to him, put his face right up to his, and says, and, Oh, sir, aren't you glad you're not going there? Oh, man, boy. Now, you talk about breaking up your day. That will do ten times the damage that a sermon will do on a Sunday morning. Because on Sunday morning, you always refer to somebody else. But a guy looks you right straight in the face and says, Oh, sir, aren't you glad you're not going there when you're going there? That Boy, that, that messed things up good. I remember one time I had a fellow saved in a meeting down in Baymanette, Alabama. Baymanette's just a wide place in the road down there, about the side of the Sand Pit, Oklahoma, or something like that. And a, and a fellow got saved there who was a stoker in a furnace. He stoked coal in a furnace. And he was a big old brute of a fellow, never went to school, all oh, third or fourth grade, something like that, and then dropped out. And uh, he wasn't, like I say, he wasn't dumb as an ox, but he wasn't any smarter either. And that old boy got saved in that meeting, and one day he came around me and said, Well, preacher, hey, preacher, he said, you are talking about witnessing, winning souls with Christ, and all stuff like that there. He said, I had no education, and I'm hardly even talking. I don't know how I can win it by the Lord. And I said, Well, just ask God to show you what to say, and open your mouth and say something. He said, Well, I got ungodly cuss what works me, just cussing and damning this and damning that and damning this all the time. I don't know what to do about it. And I said, Well, pray and ask God to show you what to do. And he did. That guy went off and prayed and asked God to show him what to do. And they're stoking this furnace. They got a furnace door here and two piles of coal taking turns shoveling this stuff in. And one day, about a week after that, they were shoveling coal there. And this guy was, you know, saying hell this and hell that and hell the other thing. And about the fifth time he said hell, this convert of mine slammed down his shovel and reached over and grabbed that guy by the seat of the butchers and the knapsack and picked him up and kicked that furnace door open with his foot like that and stuck the guy's head down in the furnace and said, you see that? See the wrong side of that thing right there? He says, it's alongside hell. That right there is an ice box. Bam! And slammed him down. <laughs> and he said for a week after that guy would shovel, he'd shovel his coal and then go back this way and pick his... <laughs> Now that fellow had an effective Christian witness. You see? He shared his Christian experience in a, in a meaningful relationship. <laughs> yeah. Now the thing is, the thing is, you pray and ask God to show you what to do and ask God to give you an opening, you can do it. The thing is, you won't cry. You won't cry. Uh, Christ said, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men. A man can't fish 365 days a year without catching fish. Any way to do it. After a while, a mullet will jump in the boat with you, man. I mean, there's no way in the world you can fish 365 days a year without catching fish. You may not catch, you know, brown trout or brook trout or rainbow trout or halibut or something you want, but you catch something. You catch something. And a Christian that is trying to win people to Christ eventually will win people to Christ. Let's see. He that winneth souls is wise. And you don't win souls? What does that make you? And like I said now, if I can do it, you can do it. And I mean that. When I first started out as a new Christian, I made every mistake you could possibly make and at least 300 you couldn't make. I made all the mistakes, man. I made, I just completely self-taught, messed up, Man, I got saved, and the first thing I did was I drove all day and all night up to Delaware where my father retired. He was a colonel, retired at a beach resort up there called Rehoboth Beach. And he retired up there, and I went up to that cottage where he and my mother were and came in there and got on my knees in front of him and asked him to forgive me for the way I'd live when I was a young man. That's, that's the first thing God got me conviction about. First thing that got me upset when I got saved was how I lived as a teenager. That's the first thing that got me. I sure put the gray hairs in my parents. I was a hippie long before you knew what a hippie was. I don't say it boastfully, but we move fast, much faster than you move. We have the marijuana band in 1938. You top that? That's 38. Croup in that bunch. You had the marijuana. They had the grass then. Well, listen, I've had old black boys playing piano in my living room in Topeka, Kansas on a jam session 2 o'clock in the morning in the white section of Topeka, Kansas in 1939. Tell me how it goes. <laughs> and I got saved, and the Lord said, the first thing is go back to your mom and daddy and apologize. And I did. I sure am glad I did. 
My mother and father and the sister all died the same year. One of them died in June, one died in July, one died in August. A whole bunch of them. I got one brother left, he never married. I'm the last of the Ruckman. That's the end of them. And you take that business, I went up there and got on my knees from my mother and daddy and cried and begged them to be saved. They thought I lost my mind. They said, well, son, you'll feel better. Maybe you ought to see a doctor in the morning. I didn't know how to witness. I didn't know how to witness. I just knew they were lost and going to hell. I didn't want them to go to hell. That's all I knew. But I stuck my neck out. After I'd been witnessing for about four years, I went back and dealt with them again. It was different the next time. By the time I dealt with two or five, three thousand people face to face, I know how to handle it. But I sure made the mistakes. I sure made them. Boy, I, I have, anybody can make them now. I can make them. I had a little boy I used to, and it was the crowd I had with. I had a bunch of rough, all my life I've been with the roughnecks for some reason. I don't know what it is. My church is not a church, it's a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in my church, if you say, how many of you been in the slammer, 40 people will stand up. <laughs> if you say, how many on drugs for you are saved, 100 will stand up, that kind of thing. And you take one of the first guys I got witnessed with, his name was Tom Brannan. He was an old street boy, a, a, a Catholic street fighter from Boston, and he got saved, he'd been in the slammer, and he'd go out and witness, and he'd put a guy against a wall and say, don't you feel the Lord dealing with you, you know, this... <laughs> That's not the way to do it. And I've seen him do this. I've seen him go out into a traffic intersection where a cop stand there and witness to the cop. And I've seen him do this and say, well, you're in a pretty dangerous business being a policeman. You ought to be saved and ready to die. You might die at any minute, you know. And the cop said, I'll run on, son. And Tom would say, well, you know, look at your pistol right there. Well, a guy might come up and just take that pistol out of a host and shoot you with your own pistol. And the cop said, oh, I know they can do that beat it, kid. And Tom would go, I don't know what he had, but he knew that thing locked or something, and he'd have the thing out right on him. And the cop put his hand there. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Tom said, just kidding, but be ready. And I had him with, that'd shake your day up too, you know. I remember, oh, I used to, I used to make, oh boy, you talk about blowing things, man. I take, I, I witnessed one time a guy who's about 19, just been in the army, and I got him say even. I went back to witness to him the next night, tried to get him rooted and grounded in the Word, and his dad was there. And when I opened the door, I asked for the boy, and he said, you don't have to see my boy. I said, well, he got saved the other night, and I want to give him some scripture. He said, uh, I don't believe in that kind of thing. And I said, well, are you born again? He said, sure, I'm born again. And I said, uh, when were you born again? He said, I've been born again since I was born. And I answered the fool according to his folly, and I said, you mean to tell me you've never sinned since you were born? And he said, nope. <laughs> I, said, I never heard that one before. He said, you heard it now. And the door shut. And I went on back to the school, and I got thinking that thing, or I got madder and madder and madder. I said to myself, well, that old man going to talk that boy out of his salvation just as soon as the guy gets saved. It's going to be the biggest mess you ever saw. I wrote that young man a note and went back to that apartment the next night when nobody was there and shoved it under the door. And the note said, your father is a liar and a hypocrite, you know, and this and that. He's going to talk you to your side, really put it on him bad. And put it under the door, and the old man got it. And he phoned up the discipline committee out there at school in the middle of the night and said, I'm going to get that blankety-blank put in this slander. I'm going to sue him. And they called me in and said, you know, that fellow's hot. You better go down and do something about that. I said, okay. So I got me a kid looked a little bit old for his age and gave him a hat and an overcoat and got him a notebook, valise, you know, where he looked kind of official, you know, kind of legal, and a pen. We went down there and knocked at the door. Old man came to the door. He's furious. I said, uh, I just came by to apologize to you about that note. I don't accept your apology. I'm going to sue you. And I turned to the guy next to me. I said, write that down. He went, you know, he wasn't writing down nothing. He acted like he was writing. And I said, well, I met, didn't mean anything personal about that when I said you were a liar. The Bible said if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his lips. See, don't forget the sword. Don't take your weapons away from you. I mean, I said, make him a liar, his word is honest, and he began to close the door. And he said, well, I'm going to sue you anyway. And I said, well, I want to have you know that I came by the witness tonight to be reconciled out of court. And he said, well, I don't accept it. And I said, write that down. He wrote the thing down. You know, nothing ever happened. You know, he got backed out. But that wasn't the right way to handle that thing. I've made those mistakes. I remember one time I was at a, uh, a German home over in Alberta, that's a German settlement over there, eating uh, with some folks called Fafs. And Fafs were good Christian folks, but they had a 15-year-old girl who was lost. 
and they've been praying for her to get saved, and she wasn't saved, and they're all going to Baptist church there in town, and she was running around with a Catholic girl, and the Catholic girl was about 17, her daddy owned a liquor store. And Mrs. Fife was just upset about that girl and so burdened about her. We were sitting around the table one day, Sunday dinner, with about 15 people there, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of the dinner, Mrs. Fife begins to cry and turns to me and says, will you go out there on that sun porch and deal with my girl? And out in that sun porch, that 15-year-old girl was out there, and that 17-year-old Catholic girl, they were out there, they didn't have enough clothes on to make a jaybird or suit of clothes, man. And I said, well, couldn't we wait some other time? And she said, well, Brother Lovin, I'm just so burdened. Would you please talk to her now? And I said, be kind of embarrassing right now. And she said, oh, Brother Lovin, I just feel like it has to be now. But you got 12 people there at the table looking at you, you know. So what do you do? So I got up and went out on the porch. And I was a session boy. I mean, I'd talk to that girl, that 15-year-old girl, and every five minutes that Catholic girl interrupts. Well, my mother is a Baptist, and she married a Catholic, and I'd say, well, I'm not talking about your mother and father. I'm talking about this girl right here, and I'd try to deal with all the scripture and the Catholic interrupt and say, your Bible isn't like our Bible. And I'd say, you got your Bible with you? She'd say, no. I'd say, fine, Catholic, you I don't have a Bible. I'd go back and deal with this girl again. And the thing went on and on, and finally that Catholic said, see there, you upset her. You're not soothing like the priest. Telling you. And I turned around that girl and I said, You know something, sister? I said, I don't know much about your religion, which was a lie. I knew her more about religion than she knew. I said, Yeah, I don't know much about your religion. My religion couldn't keep me out of the kind of clothes you got in there. I wouldn't give you a dead horse for it. Well, that isn't the right thing to say. See, that, you know, tactful, diplomatic soul winning. <laughs> and that broke that thing up, and the 15 year old was bawling. But you know something? Two weeks later, the liquor store closed down, the Catholic left town, and six weeks later, the girl got saved. She'd been teaching the Sunday school for 25 years in the Baptist church. Amen. You see, God will bless you if you make mistakes. What trouble some of you is, you're afraid of making mistakes. You're never going to learn how to swim unless you get in the water. You're never going to learn how to fish unless you put the hook in the water. You can't learn how to drive a car unless you drive it. A lady said one time, she said, before I had any children, I had six theories on how to raise children. Now I've had six children, I don't have any more theories. <laughs> now the trouble with you is, you're not willing to try and step in and find out. Now if you deal with a person about the Lord, what's the issue? Uh, those of us who do personal work, we know something about human nature the psychiatrists don't know. And we know this, we know the one thing people don't want to talk about is Jesus Christ. They'll talk about anything else. Where'd Cain get his wife? What do you think about Billy Graham? Can you lose it? Do you believe in talking in tongues? What do you think about Tammy and Jimmy and all this stuff? But they won't talk about Jesus Christ. The issue is Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I went to a doctor's office one time, a medical doctor in Greenville, Alabama, and he, he was right. Uh, there was a rumor, rumor around town that he was losing his mind because he was up at night reading his Bible all night. His little 10-year-old boy had been electrocuted in a little old playhouse out in the backyard, and people said he was crazy, losing his mind. I figured he'd probably just about to get his mind back, so I went around to deal with him. And I went to that medical doctor's office, and he came up to me and smiled and said, Good morning. I said, Good morning. I said, uh, I want to ask you a question, doctor. And he said, What's that? I said, Are you saved? And he said, I'm an Episcopalian. And I said, I was an Episcopalian too before I was saved. But he said, I was christened. I said, I was too, for I was saved. And he got kind of red in the face, came up right next to me, and he said, but, but I had a godfather and a godmother. I said, I had a godfather and godmother too, for I was saved. And he got right next to me and said, what are you trying to say? <laughs> can you take it from there? <laughs> God help you if you can't. I reach in my pocket for a Bible. I should, I'm trying to say. Point a man wants to die and after the judgment. I saw that doctor kneel in that office and get saved, floor wet with his tears, and he turned that office into a gospel supply center. Next time I came, they had Schofield Bibles all over the shelf, tracks over the wall, and they began to make gospel signs and put one up here and one up there in Alabama, and Bob Harrington got saved going by one of them signs out there in the road. Now listen, I've seen some things. I wouldn't trade my life in the 38 years I've been in the ministry for anybody's life, any time, any place, anywhere. You don't know what it's all about. You try to get win people to Christ. And once you start winning people to Christ, you'll see things that kings and mayors and governors and movie stars never get to see. And I'll tell you about them in a while. 
You know what I've seen? I'm going down Peach Tree Street in Atlanta and seen that medical doctor standing out there with tracks in this pocket, tracks in that pocket, tracks in this pocket, tracks in this pocket, tracks in that, standing out in the middle of the street, putting those things out like that. He go to the medical convention. He had a little gospel coin. He held it in his hand, one side of the coin, and said, the way to sin is death, and the other side said, the gift of God is eternal life. And every time he'd meet a new doctor at a medical convention, he'd shake his hand and leave one of those coins in his hand. Wouldn't you like to get in some of that? The issue is Christ. I picked up a fellow one time in the car, and I said, are you saved? He said, that depends upon what you mean by saved. I thought to myself, oh boy, oh man, here we go. And I said, well, the Bible said, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He said, yes, he said, but uh, through what medium do we receive him? <laughs> and I said to myself, I got me a water dog here to assure the world, it's a Camelot. And I said, well, friend, we won't argue about how we receive him. All I know is he that hath the Son hath life, and he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. Have you got him or don't you? He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. That's how the people are. They duck the issue. They want to talk about anything but Jesus Christ. Your job is to point people to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And they'll argue and try everything in the world to get around that thing and get away from that thing. You hold their feet to the fire. You make them deal with the issue. I was going down the street one time in Greenville, or Greenville uh, South Carolina, about 10 o'clock at night. And I saw two GIs follow a couple of girls down the street. They looked like a little bit drunk. They went on down the corner and stopped, and one G.I. struck up a conversation with the girls went off with them. The other G.I. came up by himself up alongside me. He came up alongside me and went over the side of the street and gave him a tract and said, uh, oh, would you like to have one of those? Look at it. He said, yeah, what's she trying to sell? I said, happiness. You want some? See? See, use wisdom. See, it's a, that's a low blow. That's a good blow. Obviously, he's miserable. Said happiness. You want some? He said, I'm a Catholic. I said, so am I. And I said, your actions tonight are a disgrace to the Catholic Church. <laughs> and I talked to that guy. We talk about four or five minutes. By every five minutes, he say, are you sure you're a Catholic? Yes, sir, boy. I put the scripture in him. At about five minutes, he said, I never heard of a Catholic like that. <laughs> and I kept putting the scripture in front. He said, what kind of Catholic are you anyway? I said, apostolic. See, I mean, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, man. That's the tactic. And the old color preacher said about four serpents to one dove. <laughs> and I said, oh, he said, I'm Roman, I'm Roman. <laughs> I talked to that fellow while about the Lord, and then finally I decided I had about enough, and I said, well, I want to ask you three questions. Will you answer me man to man, give me an honest answer if I ask you three questions? He said, sure, go ahead and shoot. I said, okay, let me ask you this. I said, are you happy? And he said, no. I said, if you drop dead right this minute, do you know where you go if you're going to die? He said, no. I said, do you know you're a sin that's forgiven? Can you produce it in writing? And he said, no. And I put my arm on him. I said, let me tell you something, buddy. I said, I don't know what kind of religion you got, which was a lie. I knew it better than he knew it. I said, I don't know what kind of religion you got, but any religion that couldn't give me a yes answer to those three questions, I wouldn't give you a dead horse for it. I gave him a track by John R. Rice, what must do to be saved. And he went off reading it. I didn't leave that guy the law, but I got the gospel into his hand. You know what that thing is? Your tactics are use wisdom. Use wisdom. Use wisdom. When Hugh Powell led me to Christ, he was, he was a wise soul winner. And he didn't let things shock him. He told me to pray in the record room. And I said, I don't know how to pray. He said, well, just in your own. And I was, I was, I wasn't kidding. I never prayed. I, I knew Hail Mary and our Father, but I didn't know how to pray. And he said, well, just in your own words, ask Christ to save you. So I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm a blankety blank sinner and I'm going to hell sure as blankety blank if something don't happen pretty blankety blank soon. I want you to save my blankety blank soul for Jesus' sake. Amen. I cussed her through the prayer. And when I got through, he was standing there and instead of getting upset, he said, did you mean that prayer? I said, you blankety blank right I meant that prayer. And I did. I did. Honest to God, I did. But you know, you just get talking like that. You don't know what you're saying. Guys just get run at the mouth. They don't check what they're saying. He knew that. So he just ignored it. And he led me to Christ. He just stepped by it. You know what that is? That's wisdom. That's wisdom. You want to use wisdom. When I first got saved, I had a fellow I used to run around with in Pensacola named Pete Cicchini. 
It's a strange thing. I don't understand this day. But all my friends before I say were Roman, Roman, uh, or Italian Roman Catholics. Pete Cicchini, Nick Trelizzi, Tony Bertini, Joe Zaza, Al Aloyas. I mean the real thing, man. And when I got saved, all my friends turned into German Protestants. It's almost like coming to the Alps, you know. <laughs> and anyway, this Pete Cicchini and I used to get drunk together and have beer and stuff together and I got saved. The day I got saved, I, I went to, uh, uh, to, uh, not the day about the week, got saved, went to Hugh Pyle and I, he had an evangelist in preaching that week named McGinley. And I said to him, I said, what am I going to do when my old buddy asked me to go out and have a drink? I said, how am I going to get rid of him? He said, you won't have to get rid of him, he'll get rid of you. And I said, no, he won't get rid of me. He and I have been friends for years. He won't get rid of me. And McGinley said, he will if you witness for Christ. You afraid to witness for Christ? I said, no, I ain't afraid to witness for Christ. He said, okay, you do that and he'll get rid of you. And the next day there in the record room of the radio station, time came off to get off work. And Pete said, let's go have a beer, Ruckman. I said, be right with you. And I said, step back in the record room a minute. And I got him back in the record room, backed him up against the wall, and I said, you know what happened to me last week? He said, what? I got saved. He said, you got what? I said, I got saved. And he began to back along the counter this way, reaching for the door behind him. And he said, oh, Ruckman, you're getting religion. You're getting religion. I said, I didn't get religion. I got saved. And he went out the door. Never saw him again. Boy, I went off to Bob Jones. and gone for about, oh, about 18 months. And Hugh Pyle invited me back to preach at the church. Brent, well, I was saved. I wrote Pete Cicchini. I said, I'm coming back to Brent. I'm going to be preaching you for Christ Saturday night. How about you being there? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. So I came in and sat down and looked out across that crowd, and there was old Pete back there with his family, and he was winking at me, you know. <laughs> he thought, you know, big deal, you know, Ruckman the con man, you know. <laughs> and I remember sitting looking at him and thought to myself, boy, what a night it's going to be for you, buddy. <laughs> and I got up and we got started, boy, and they all laughed, and you know, at the first of the thing, and they got quieter and quieter. Pretty soon I saw Pete back there just... He know what gone wrong. That meat was all over. He came up and stood up alongside me and he said, Boy, Ruckman, something sure happened to you. I said, I got saved. Like I told you, I got saved. And then I noticed when he talked to me, he couldn't look at me. He'd, he'd, like this. And then I knew what had happened. You know, I'd, I'd been saved about 18 months and I'd read that Bible through about 36 times or more. And it'd done something from my face. I, I was, he couldn't look at my face. So I said, Pete, I said, Look me right in the eye. He looked up and he looked down. I said, now, Pete, I said, if you look me right in the eye and tell me I don't have something you need, I'll let you go and never bother you again. He said, okay. They looked him right straight in the eye and he said, you got something I need and I need it bad. <laughs> and back in the room we went, he got on the knees and got to say. See, don't lose the fish just because you lack wisdom. I mean, lack wisdom, uh, ask for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. I had a father there at one time, I used to know for our same name, Buddy. I forget his last name now, we just call him Buddy. And his wife was a widow woman, she worked like a dog to support him and raised him and she was saved, he wasn't saved. Finally got to be about 18, joined the Marines. I didn't see him for about something like two years. The one day I was preaching at Brent, I looked out there and there was old Buddy out there. His left chest looked like an Army and Navy store, man. He had everything there but the Congressional Medal, he might have had that in his pocket. And his mother sitting beside him, a little small white-haired woman, you know, and I gave the invitation, nothing happened, and after the meeting was over, Buddy came down the aisle and came up the platform and got talking with me. I said, Buddy, why don't you get saved? He said, Pete, I don't believe there's a God. I said, well, you willing to find out? He said, listen, I've been over in Korea. And if you saw what I saw, you wouldn't believe in God either. I said, well, are you willing to find out if there's one or not? Well, he said, yeah, I guess they will. And I said, come on, took him back in the back room. And I got down there, and we got on our knees, and I said, now I want to have you pray with me. And I just pray after me. I said, dear God, he said, but I don't believe there is a God. I said, okay. I said, dear God, if there is a God. And he says, dear God, if there is a God. And I said, if Christ was your son, he says, if Christ were your son, I want you to show me. He said, I want you to show me. Amen, amen. They're sitting there in the dark, and I start again. I said, dear God, if there is a God, we pray through that thing four times like that. And the fifth time, I said, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And he prayed, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> Make a long story short, about the sixth time through, he was born like a baby and got saved. Now, there's a fellow who says, I'm an atheist. You're supposed to throw up your hands and say, well, there's no use talking to him. 
But there is. There is. You see, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. You pray for wisdom. Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You know why a fellow says I'm an atheist and I'm an agnostic or I'm a Catholic? You know why he says that? He said that to shock you, to shut your mouth, to get rid of you. I knocked on the door one time down Penn School and I said to the lady, I came to the door, are you saved? She said, I'm a Catholic. I said, that's okay. That's all right. God can save Catholics as well as anybody else. <laughs> See, I'm just ways to get in there. You knock the door, they say, I'm a Catholic. You say, were you saved Catholic or lost Catholic? I said that to the fellow one time. He said, well, I guess I'm the wrong kind and led him to Christ. Now, there's ways to do it, see, but you want to you want to use wisdom. He says, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Now, use your head. Use your head. Um, some of God's people do some real foolish, stupid things they don't have to do. I mean, you're going to ask grace or say the blessing in a restaurant, you don't have to stand the table. Oh, God, bless this food to your glory. Amen. You know, I mean, you don't have to make a fool out of yourself. There's, don't, don't give us that cough prayer either, you know. Don't give us that blessing, you know, <coughs> you know, then eat. I mean, ask the blessing. <laughs> but you don't have to, you know, get right out there and blow a thing. There are ways to do things, and the, the trick for you in the Bible is be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Uh, wise as a serpent, what's that? Like, that's like the devil. I mean, use wisdom. Don't let the fish escape just because you don't have any sense. Ask God to give you some sense and show them how to put the, uh, uh, gaff, get him in the boat and gaff him. Make sure he don't get back out again. You're out there and you witness, and sometimes it's a real open door, sometimes it's a closed door. I'm going down the street one day, and I passed by four or five men. I hear one of them say, well, take the damn money. And I turned around and came back to him. I said, pardon me, gentlemen. I said, the only time that money will damn a man is when it keeps him from Christ. Have a try. <laughs> you think I didn't break that thing up? What? <laughs> Boy, if you want to put a chill in a happy hour, you just try that sometime. I had a, I had a, I had a fellow I used to go out with. He was a sweet kid. I mean, he was almost effeminate, that kid. He never drank nothing strong in buttermilk. He just raised right, you know. He and me made a pear man. Like, you know, Tiny Tim and Larry Zonker. It was a weird combination. But that guy had guts. He had guts. Sometimes they fool you. Sometimes these guys raised in a Christian home and never done anything. Sometimes they got the courage like a lion, boy. And he had it. And this guy, I'll tell you, I've seen him do. I've seen him go into a, a, a gas station late at night out in the highway around 12.30 and things are closed down up in the mountains. A bunch of old cars are sitting around there playing checkers and cussing and drinking beer and bootleg whiskey. And I've seen him go into that thing with about 10 of them in there walking the door and say, oh, you fellas know my friend? And a bunch of guys say, no, 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 who's your friend? I don't know who's your friend. Who's your friend? Who's your friend? friend? It's my friend Jesus. I heard his name in here. You fellas know him? Oh, man, boy. One out here, one out there, one out here, one out there. There's a way to do it. I saw that fellow one time. I saw one of the remarkable things ever saw. Now, see, I've seen some things. You don't see these things on TV. People, these world celebrities, they never seen anything like this. I've seen it. I wouldn't take all the tea in China for it. I wouldn't go back and live my life over and miss what I've seen for anything in the ministry. Did you ever use a wordless book? A wordless book is red, you know, black and white and, and, and green, you know, and yellow, and you take them to the plan of salvation. It's a kid's book used in the edification Bible school. Well, this kid would carry one with him. He was about 23 years old. And one day, I finished preaching the street, and I come down off the truck, and I stand there, I saw him across the street, and across the street, there were four Marines over there waiting for a bus. I mean, battle hard, and all looked like gunners, top stripes, you know, over there. Hard, heavy, sinful faces, you know, metal all over them, hash marks all over the sleeve. And I saw him go over there with this wordless book. And I thought, he's going to get killed. He's going to get killed. <laughs> and he went over there and stood in front of those four guys and said, Now, fellas, I want to show you something. I mean, just, oh, man. And opened this without guile. And opened that thing up and said, this green means the garden. And once many years ago, your parents were in a beautiful garden. Now watch those Marines. One of them, like this, one of them, like this. Who's the one? <laughs> What's that guy? He come down to there and he said, and sin came in, and now we must have the blood of Christ. Those guys, two of them got crying, man. And he led one of them the Lord before they got to the bus. Wild, man. One of those guys stepped out of ranks. Knelt down there with the corner and got saved. Now you don't, listen, you don't know what God will do till you start doing it. 
Do you want adventure? Do you want excitement? Do you want to see the world? <laughs> I'll tell you what, don't join the army. <laughs> Try to win people to Christ. You'll see it. You'll see it. You'll see it. I've come around. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I've come around the corner and a guy there cleaning, scraping off uh, carbon off a piston with a knife. And I stopped and said, are you saved? And he says, get out of here. <laughs> I said, well, uh, could I leave you tracked? <laughs> you don't go quit right away. And he says, get out of here before I sick my dog on you. And a big old German shepherd comes stalking around the corner. Well, you got to quit sometime, you know. <laughs> but you want to, but you want to, don't give up too quick. So I said, can I pray for you? And he says, get out of here. Well, it's time to leave, see. I, I used to preach with a fellow named Phil Schuler, uh Bob Schuler's boy. I've seen Phil Schuler go up. He witnessed a 12-year-old girl at a gate up there in the mountain. Some old farmer come out with a shotgun, tell him to get the blankety blank off there, or he'd shoot him. And I've seen Phil Schuler walk up that, Step right to that porch and take that shotgun out of that guy's hand. Do them about the Lord. The stuff you see in the movie, this made up, this stuff here is real. It's real. You want to see it? Get going. Or how to use tactics. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Sometimes they're ready to be saved, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they fall off like a ripe plum, a ripe fig right in your hand. Sometimes they don't. I lead man to Christ, I say, will you accept Christ your Savior? If the man says yes, I say, let's pray. And then you pray. Don't wait for it. You pray. In the first place, he may be bashful. In the second place, he may not know how to pray. In the third place, he may not really be under conviction yet. But if you kneel and pray in front of him, he'll get under conviction. It's not every day somebody just prays for you out in public. You know that, don't you? I already told you, stopped a guy at a, at, a, at a bus stop one time and said, Are you saved? And he said, Get away here, you blankety blank blank. And Tor just dropped in his knees right beside the guy. And said, oh God, please take this poor, godless, wicked, hell-bound devil and his soul. Man, save his soul from a devil's hell. When he got through, that guy was shaking like a leaf in a storm, man. So when you get him up there, the guy doesn't pray, you pray. And then if he doesn't pray, you say, now if you'd like the Lord to save you, just in your own words. See, say that. In your own words, ask him to save you. Now you want to say that. You want to say in your own words. Because some people think if they're not praying like a preacher, they're not praying, you know. To say in your own words, ask Christ to save you. Then he may begin, he may not begin. He may even hesitate there. If he hesitates there, you say, all right, if you mean business, I'll lead you in prayer and you follow. Listen, if they're not going to get saved, they'll back out. I've had my hand two inches from the guy to receive Christ and have him for 30 minutes, the hand that far away and never make the move. I've had him take my hand, begin to pray, and then stop in the middle of the prayer and say, well, I guess I'm not quite ready yet, and back out. But use wisdom. Sometimes they're ripe. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're so ready, it frightens you. I remember one time I was going down the streets in a town in Carolina someplace. I preached in 120 towns within 100 miles of Greenville, South Carolina, in six years, on the street. And I was going down the street one night about 10 o'clock, and I saw a cripple coming up the street, a fellow about 60 years old, I don't know what it was, a newspaper man or what, but he came up there along the street and I came out to him and I said, pardon me, sir, are you a Christian? And he stopped in his crutches and said, no. And I said, would you like to be saved? He said, yes. I said, well, Christ died for sinners and he'll save you if you'll ask him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why don't we have a word of prayer? And I was going to take him off the street under one of those arcades by one of those stores to have a word of prayer and that bird dropped on his knees right in front of me. And he began to pray. You could have heard that bird for a country mile. Like to scared me to death. <laughs> oh, God, I don't want to go to hell. Oh, God, please. Oh, my stars, man. <laughs> now, you know what that guy had been through before you got to him, but he's ready. And once in a while you find him like that. Not often enough. I preached in the street one time, a little old town called Simpsonville, Carolina. And I got through preaching there. I said, if any of you people here would like to receive Christ your Savior, step forward and take a tract out of my hand. There's all kind of ways of giving invitation. And nobody came forward, and I started to pack up. About that time, a big old fellow about six feet four, as skinny as a rail, with a cowboy hat on, stepped out there and took a track. I said, you going to receive the Lord Jesus? said, yes, sir, preacher, I think I will. I said, okay, good. Let's go around behind this store here and have a word of prayer. And he took off that hat and dropped his knees right there in the gutter and said, no, sir, preacher, I lived all my life in the gutter, and I'm going to get saved in the gutter. 
I've heard said, I got a Christian wife that's praying for me, been praying me 50 years, I'm going home and tell her she got a Christian husband. Yeah. Bam! Now, I've seen some things, see? You don't find that in any documentary. You can watch some TV till your hair turns white and falls out. You never see what I just said. I've seen it. That's, you try to win the souls of Christ, you'll see things that nobody on this earth has seen. The thing is, some of you don't have any sense of adventure. You don't have any sense of spirit. I don't know what it is about you. I don't know what it is. Don't you want to be a soul winner? Don't you want to win somebody to Christ before you die? You going to go home empty handed? Jack Hiles has great grandchildren of mine up there and doesn't even know it. Years ago, I led a fellow to Christ named Cecil Ford. And Cecil Ford was an instrument from Vietnam. And his outfit was a medic, a Japanese medic named Barney Ia from Hawaii. And Cecil Ford led Barney Ia the Lord. And Barney Ia went up the Hiles and became a bus driver. And drove them bus and picked those kids and led, led those kids to the Lord. Some of the kids he led the Lord stayed at Hiles and went to school at Hiles Anderson. I get to heaven, I'll have Cecil Ford, that's my son. And Barney Ia, that's my grandson. And then I'll have these other fellows that they picked up. Those are my great-grandchildren. And if they're in the ministry, their, ki- their souls are my great-great-grandchildren. You got anything like that around? I was preaching one time in a certain town. That time they said the Brother Hiles was preaching an afternoon service someplace in the fellowship. I went by to hear him. I went by to hear him, and the thing was all over. The fellow comes up alongside me, and he says, uh, you know me? I said, no, I don't recall you. He said, well, I'm one of your converts. And I said, where are you converted? He mentioned a certain town in Carolina, and I don't remember ever having preached there. And I said, I don't remember being there. He said, well, you preach there. You think now. He said, you remember a gas station in that town? And I got thinking and thinking. I couldn't get a hold of it. And then I remembered that one cold November afternoon, I took my board, which is about half the size of this one, had aluminum easel you could pack up in the car, and I'd go into this little town, I'd set up this easel in front of a junior high school to preach to these kids coming by the junior high school, and it was by a gas station, I'd set it up on the gas station uh, corner facing these kids, and it was a cold winter day, and nobody stopped hearing me preach. They'd come by, and nobody to stop. And I'd just preach my fool head off, and nobody heard me. <laughs> But this guy that was in the gas station behind me heard the thing. And he heard the whole thing he got saved, hear me preach at these kids, and God called him to preach, and he went back on the call to preach, and God broke his leg. And then he got right with the Lord and answered the call to preach. When I met him in that parking lot, he'd been pastoring the church for 15 years. Don't you want some of that action? You know what I met up in, in, in Batesburg, South Carolina? I met a girl at a Christian camp who said, you led my mother to the Lord, and she's been teaching chalk talk, and I'm a chalk talk artist. I got two generations. Listen, folks, if I were to die tonight, I've got spiritual children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren all over this country going right on and on and on and on. If you're a doctor, you can't do that. If you're a lawyer, you can't do that. A doctor lawyer can help a family in one generation, or maybe two but not eternity. This thing is here eternal. You going to get in on it? What are you, man or mouse? <laughs> Give me a piece of cheese and you'll find out. That's how stuff, you know. All right, now the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is this. This is the decision. How do you get a decision? You know, the devil doesn't care what you do with a person as long as they don't receive Jesus Christ. Of course, he doesn't want you to witness to him, but I mean, anything short of receiving Christ is not salvation. The touchstone of the Bible is John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Anything short of that is not salvation. A man can repent, not be saved. Judas did. A man can believe, not be saved. Simon the sorcerer did. A man can be baptized. Pharaoh was. <laughs> didn't do him any good. But you cannot receive Jesus Christ without being saved. So what you want to do is get the name of the dotted line. Now, about the time you try to get that sinner to trust Jesus Christ, that's where everything goes to pieces. That's what the devil doesn't want. That's why when the invitation comes, people all have to leave, have to get up and go out the back door, drop song books, kid got to get a drink, all this stuff, PA system breaks down. When you get right there, then the pressure comes in. Oh, I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. 
I'd have eaten one time in Landmark Baptist Church up in uh, Cincinnati when they, it was the old one downtown in Lachlan, Lachlan Baptist Church, had big high arches. And one night there in the invitation, a dove flew in there. And people were standing there singing, just as I am. Watch that cop picking dove fly on the inside of that thing without one plea. <laughs> Old Rollins gave an invitation out in the West Texas time one time and what about five standards nobody got saved. He got burdened and kept pressing the invitation. Won't you please come to Christ? Won't you please come to Christ? And about the fifth standard, mm -hmm. Uh, 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 a hand came to the open door and walked down the aisle. <laughs> Blow the whole thing, man. I had a meeting one time in a little old country church in Alabama and came the invitation and a rat. I, I stamped my foot like that and a rat shot out my mother's foot and went through the whole building. And people jumping up and benches, eek, 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 you know, trying to. What the devil doesn't want you to do is get that sinner to receive Jesus Christ. I was in a, in a home one time in Tallahassee with Bob Taylor, and we were talking to one about her soul, and she got right the place she's ready to get saved. I mean, right on the verge of it. And just about the time we said, let's kneel for prayer, there was a knock at the door, and some relatives she hadn't seen for eight years showed up unannounced from 400 miles away. Just right on the money. You get ready to lead them to Christ, the shutter rolls up. The TV goes bad. The kids get in a fight in the next room. Devil don't want you to get that decision. Use wisdom in those things. Pray about those things. One of the best ways to get a decision is have them take your hand. That's a natural gesture. One of the ways to get a decision is have them come forward near the order. Go back to the prayer room. Folks, it's not the proposition that you give them. It's what you say to them when you give them the proposition. If I said, you want to go to heaven? Come down the order and pray through and repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for mission of sins. You go to hell. But if I said, come down and stand your head on top of that seat and receive Jesus Christ, you'd get saved. You see, it's the proposition. It's what the fellow says. It's receiving Christ that saves you. Some say, I don't think you just go down the aisle and take the preacher's hand and be saved. Sure you can if you're receiving Jesus Christ when you're doing it. And if you went down and prayed 40 minutes and then received Christ, you go to hell at the altar. So when you give the invitation, say, would you accept Christ your Savior? If you will, take my hand and pray for him with him. Haven't you ever done that? You've been saved some of you 10, 20, 30 years, you've never done that? I know people in my church, some people in my church have been saved 10, 20, 30 years, they've never led a soul to Christ. You bring people to church, thank God for that, you invite them out to own them that, you invite people to come to church, fine. But have you ever actually led, knelt with a man or woman and led him to Jesus Christ? You ever done that? you haven't done that, you miss one of the greatest things in your life. I've led people to Christ over dinners. I've led them to Christ standing up in bus stations. I've led them to Christ sitting in airplanes. Any, any place you can do so with him. I led a lawyer to Christ one time in, Pensco in Panama City, and he had just ordered a $15 lobster dinner, and he was so excited about getting saved, he didn't even eat his dinner. I finished my whole dinner dealing with him, and he got saved over the plate, and he hadn't eaten a bite yet. There are ways to do it. When the invitation comes, that's when the trouble starts. Down in Pensacola, Florida, somewhere near there, there's a, there's a doctor named Melvin Young. And uh, he'd been witness to by every godly person in that town that ever died in front of him. And I used to go over to his uh, office before I was saved, where I was a radio announcer. I'd go across the hallway to his office and drink wine out of his cabinet between uh, programs. When I got saved, I sent him letters while I was away at school. I sent him one letter every month for eight months and prayed for him. I know he's going to have to witness to him. I came up back to Pensacola after eight months, went to his office and dealt with him. i never seen a man in a worse conviction in my life. That old doctor sat there at that desk and I sat across from him for 30 minutes. I put it on him. His face just looked like a man in a hailstorm. Then at 30 minutes I got up and I said, Now, Doc, and I got my hand across the desk. I said, If you will, the best way you know how, receive the Lord Jesus and Bang, that telephone rang right on the desk in front of us. And that doctor, he shook his head and then said hello in his emergency call. And he grabbed that hat and coat and tore there. And I never had a chance to witness to him again. You want to pray for that? The name is Melvin Young. I got news about two months ago. He was under conviction. And one of our church members is in a position where he can lead him to Christ. When you get that thing where the invitation comes, then it all breaks loose. Now, it's the proposition that you give that saves them. Will you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? 
I'll tell you the wildest invitation I ever gave in my life. I gave in a speeding car 55 miles an hour at night. We were coming back from Swanborough, North Carolina, and a meeting, and we had this PA system in the car. Now, if you want to have some fun, you get your big speaker. You put it on top of the car. If they arrest you, put it in the motor hood where they can't see you, and then tune that thing up and go out here at night in these farm areas and go across the farm area about 12 o'clock at night, turn that thing on, and say, Prepare to meet thy God. <laughs> you see lights going pop, 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 pop all around. Then, then you do this. You, on a Friday night after a ball game, you pull in these fast food joints and pull up in that park, get your order, and by the time you leave, you turn that thing on and you say, The eye is the Lord on every place, beholding the good and evil. <laughs> or they'll drag out of there like nothing more. They'll burn rubber getting out of there. You do all kinds of things, that thing. Uh, I remember one night we were coming down a, we were coming down a road and, and I had a fellow with me named Bob Persons driving the car and I said, Turn that thing on. He turned that thing on and it was late at night, by 11.30, and we were coming through a town, we were coasting down a hill, and we were getting ready to go by a house that had a big bay window that kind of stuck out almost to the highway. And there were two couples in there playing bridge. And they evidently had just dealt the hands. And we drove by that thing, I said, put it in neutral so I don't hear it. So we got in neutral and just slipped by that. I turned that thing on, I said, it is a plan of men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. And that scene was the wildest scene you've ever seen in your life. All four of those people were like this, looking at their hands. And when I said that, all four of them did this. All four of them went, <laughs> looking each other across the table, like this. And it was so funny, you almost got hysterical, man. I mean, we had to get the thing turned off. We'd be laughing over the PA system. We went on down the road, and Bob said, you know, I bet about the time that car game, game busted up, somebody said, well, so long, we'll see you at the judgment. <laughs> That, that verse of scripture, get in there and do something. We're ever going down the road about 50 miles now, late at night, come back from Swanboro, been preaching the Marine base up there, and coming back through Carolina someplace, and long about 1 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> the car comes up and passes us and slows down, and I turn that speaker. I preach him a message in the white throne judgment at 50 miles an hour, going down that road at night. When I got all through, I had me a turntable back there and pulling a record and played softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and me, <laughs> paid that thing down, got that mic, and said, if you have ever accepted Christ your Savior, blink your lights. <laughs> You've got to give an invitation. <laughs> I said, blink your lights. This guy didn't blink his lights. And I said, if you have ever trusted Christ your Savior, blink your lights. He didn't blink his lights. I said, if you will right now, the best way you know how to trust Jesus Christ your Savior, blink your lights. He didn't blink his lights. At about 10 miles down the road, boom, he shot off and fell off the side road, didn't see him again. And you wouldn't believe it, but 15 miles down that road, the same car, boom, around front, slows down again. I put my microphone, preach hell, and damnation, boy, took his hide off. <laughs> 15 minutes, got the invitation, put on the turntable, you know, and played just sign without one play. And I said, if you want to trust Christ your Savior, blink your lights. No traffic come either direction for 50 miles, man. And all of a sudden, that fellow's lights went, bip, 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 and he turned off the road. Somebody said, you believe in a fly-by-night decision like that? <laughs> I gave him the right proposition. That's up to him whether he responded right or not. I gave him the right proposition. If that fellow answered my proposition, he got saved by blinking his lights. <laughs> I've seen it, people. I've seen it. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I'm one of these spoiled characters. You never met a more spoiled man in your life. I'm one of these characters that God let live 27 years and just go the full length of the tether and taste the whole thing to see there was nothing in it. And then spared him then put him in and gave him 38 years to make it right. I wouldn't trade for nothing. I've been in Catholic monasteries passing out tracts to Trappist monks where a life photographer couldn't get in. I've been in a Trappist monastery going through the private booths where they sleep, putting out John L. Rice's what must it do to be saved. How'd you get in? That's a long story. But you want to you get around to doing it? Start winning them to Christ. You want to see action? You'll see action. Boy, you'll see it. One of our boys got clobbered in the eye about last week out in the street. Three years ago, one of them got stuck with a knife. 
Three weeks ago, one of them got a gun pulled on him, and the police came in and put the guy, the slammer out for about five years for carrying a weapon. But you want to see the thing move. You get in this business here, you'll see it move. Like I say, I've seen some things, and I wouldn't trade them for anything. Absolutely nothing. The Lord said, well, I'll tell you what, Peter, do. I, if you'll just let me erase all the experience you've been through when I took you through when I showed you, and I'll give you $5 million for it, I'll tell the Lord, keep the money. Honest to God. Honest to God. Down there in Alabama, along about Wing, Alabama, I said, hello, another wide place on the road down there. I had a meeting down there one time. They said, Brother Ruckman, so-and-so's back in town. I forget his name. I'll just call him Henry. Henry was a character. He was a cutter. He was a pistol ball. He, he worked up in the Great Lakes in the winter and then farm in the summer and cuss and whoremongering, you know, and fight and all that. All the whole thing, you know. He was about six feet three. Had a little wife about five feet four. Poor as Job's turkey man. And, and they said, Henry's back in town and, and his wife will want to have you over for supper. How about you going there with him? I said, I'll be over there with him. So over that night, late, late not supper then in the afternoon, about 4.30, you know, down, down there. And I got over there and here this old board house with a uh, holes in the floor and chicken scratched up in the yard, you know, a bunch of little kids, all the youngest about three and the oldest about ten, maybe three or four of them running around there and just poor as they could be. And Henry, a big old fellow overall, bare feet. We came in and sat down and ate. And, uh, they didn't have much money and she wasn't much of a cook. That cornbread looked like blue paste, you know. <laughs> we sat down there, had some cold black eyed peas, put pepper sauce on them so you could taste them. We're sitting there, and after supper, I said to Henry, I said, uh, Henry, let's go in the living room and talk a while. Okay, preacher. I the living room, sat down on the couch, and I began to preach to him. I preached to him about 20 minutes. And he seemed like he's under conviction. And I said, now, Henry, I said, uh, if you will trust Christ your Savior, about that time, beep, horn outside, pickup truck. Some horse trader come there bringing a horse in for him to look at. He says, pardon me, preacher. He gets up and goes out to the front porch. And I get on my knees. And I say, God, blow up that truck, kill that horse, do something. <laughs> but get that thing out of here and give me a chance to win Henry of the Lord. <laughs> and Henry comes back in after about 20 minutes and says, uh, well, sir, I'd take care of that. Go ahead, preacher. So I preached to him again, 15 minutes, went after him. And after about 15 minutes, I thought he was under conviction again. And I said, Henry, now if you will the best way you know how I'll receive and Wah! in the back room one kid got in a fight with another kid and the rocking chair went over and the kid was yelling and Henry gets up excuse me preacher lumps out of the room and goes to the back room I get on in a panic man I got my knees and said God do something this guy's going to go to hell if you don't do something here come Henry back in and sits down again and I was exhausted I just sat there and looked at him <laughs> he looked at me <laughs> and finally I said uh, let's pray <laughs> Bam! We got on our knees. We got on our knees and let that old boy the Lord. And he got down there and he got up, he was crying, wiping his nose, and he said, I sure feel better, preacher. And I said, well, it's all right to feel better. I said, but you're not saved by feeling. He said, I know that, but I still feel better anyways. I said, good. I said, now go and tell your wife what you've done. And like I said, see, uh, I mean, I wouldn't trade for nothing. I wouldn't trade for nothing. I've seen some things. I have flat seen them. You travel around the world 50 times, you'd never see them. That old boy went in the back of that back room, and his wife was back there on her bare feet by bed, a little handkerchief she was twisting up in her hands. She'd been playing for him for about 10, 15 years, and he stood behind her. I thought for a minute he wasn't going to make it. An old hulk of a man stand there in the evening shadows behind that little woman, and I heard her say, what would you do, Henry? <laughs> oh, boy, stand there. I thought he wasn't going to make it. And I heard him say, Well, I... <laughs> I done trusted the Lord. I just broke up all over the place, man. Just blubbered. <laughs> Got on there on his knees. And listen, when I left that house that day, the last thing I saw, I looked back in that bedroom and saw that man, that woman, kneeling back by that bed together, praying together. You couldn't buy me for nothing. No way. No way. I've seen it. I wouldn't miss it for nothing. Well, I could tell you, you know, I'm not a great soul winner. I never have been a very great soul winner. I've won a few. Not a lot. But like I said at the beginning of the message, some of you people could win 
You could win ten times many people to Christ in years I could. But you won't do it. You know why you won't? You're just sorry. Just sorry. You've got good looks and you don't use them when people are Christ. You've got friendly, sociable ways and you won't use them when people are Christ. You can talk good. You make a good impression. You won't give it to God. If I were you, I'd do it. I'd get in the real thing. Let's stand for prayer. Let's stand for prayer. Father, bless your people tonight. I've been kind of hard on some of these folks, but maybe you're going to be harder than I'm going to be. And I pray you'll spare them tonight and show them how to do this work and get them busy at this kind of work. Some have unsaved mothers and fathers, and they're discouraged because they couldn't win their parents the Lord. Lord, have them get busy and win somebody else's parents the Lord. If they can't win their boys and girls the Lord, may they win somebody else's boys and girls the Lord. If they can't win the people of Christ in their block, may you give them somebody outside of their block. But Lord, take this congregation here, we pray now, make soul winners out of them, and get them on the rich things and the good things of life, the real things, the eternal things. And Lord, I don't know how many years I've got left. I'm up near the free score and ten now. And Lord, I want to thank you for the years you gave me to redeem myself and buy back those terrible years that were wasted. And most of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity you give me to train young men and prepare young men to lead them the right way and instead of the wrong way. And like I told these people, I wouldn't trade anything for it, Lord. And it's been kind of tough sometimes. Sometimes it's been downright agonizing. But I wouldn't trade it, Lord. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't renounce my heritage, what you gave me, for anything. And I pray you might give it to somebody here. I let us remain in prayer, head bowed and eyes, close a few minutes while we're in prayer, and our musicians playing. At a moment I'd like to have a sing. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Before we sing, I want you to Christian people to look back through your life and ask yourself, have I ever led anybody to Christ? When was the last time I led somebody to Christ? I'm not talking about inviting them to church. I mean, thank God if you do, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when was the last time you told a man or woman how to get saved and then led them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. While we're in prayer, how many of you Christians, you've led somebody to Christ this year? Would you raise your hand? This year, you led somebody to Christ. All right, good. That's about 20 or 30 of them here. Let me ask you this. How many of people save, and as far as you know, you've never actually led a soul to Christ in your life, but you'd like to, you want to, could I see your hand? Would you raise your hand? There you go, about 20 more hands. Now, the thing for you to do is start. Stick your neck out for Christ, make a fool out of yourself for Christ's sake, and start. And God will bless you. He'll take care of you. Bob Jones used to say, God will put the angels in half ration to take care of a soul winner. And I believe that. Father, bless the invitation to speak to hearts of men and women, boys and girls, about these matters. May there be some repentance here and some change of action, some change of conduct. And may these people be wise in the future and win souls. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. What number?